Our next speaker is Michelle. Now, Michelle is a wife, mother, and sought-after comedian whose appearances include Nickelodeon's Search for the Funniest Mom in America. She's hilarious. You're going to love this. Now, she is an Open Society Institute community fellow. She's created a program called Gold Diggers. Not, not Gold Diggers, but Gold Diggers, the Sankofa Project. And it includes 15 African-American girls from Baltimore City, um, and they are taught to study their ancestry, heritage, and lineage utilizing anthropology, technology, and DNA testing. And at the end of the program, they take all 15 girls to Ghana and West Africa. And it is an incredible program. She's an incredible comedian. I've had some rough times in my life. It's not always been rosy and cheery like I appear today. And every time I'm going through something, I can always count on a phone call from this comedian, Michelle, who touches my heart. You're going to enjoy it. Michelle, welcome. Thank you. And so the first thing you're thinking is, who is this cute woman? I know you're thinking that. With the red hair, who does that? I am so excited about being here today at Ted, and I know I don't have a lot of time, but I do have to say this. When I first met Ted, I knew that he was a white man. That's what the first thing. <laughs> and then I thought maybe that he had some transformation and he had become a Muslim, thus Ted X. But if you don't get that, <laughs> we don't have a lot of time, so you got to go home and Google some stuff to catch up later. <laughs> Or for those of you who are hard up, you probably got your, your iPad out right now, you're Googling, why is that funny, TEDx? But <laughs> again, um, you know, I'm known as Michelle, and, and on the comedy arena, I'm Michelle, the indie mom of comedy. And I just want to tell you what that is real quick so you can have a better backdrop about me. I'm a wife and a mother. I've been married 12 years this year. And I have three small children, nine, seven, and four. I happen to be married to another one of the TEDx talkers tonight. You'll see him later in the half hour. He is Lamar Darnell Shields. I call him the um, broke Denzel Washington. He is amazing. <laughs> broke in the sense that we don't have the same bank account, but very rich in intellect and very attractive with beautiful teeth. And so. <laughs> So it all works out. He happens, um, I, I, would, I would take too long talking about him. He would take up too many of my minutes, and I'll see him after the show. So um, I don't need to talk about him too much. But I do want to say this. An indie mom is a woman who believes that it's OK and great to be a mom, and it's awesome to be a wife. But you've got to hold on to yourself as well. You've got to have some balance in your life. You, and, and my mantra is, in order to be a good indie mom, you still have to be innovative and independent in a lot of ways. And what has helped me stay innovative is leaving a PhD program and becoming a stand-up comic. That was a very innovative idea. <laughs> Uh, I'm still trying to figure out whether it was a good choice, but I think some of my resume would suggest that I've made some good decisions throughout this course of time. But I'll tell you what's been most innovative about being an indie mom. I've created this concept that if you do what you love and you live your dream, you're a happier mom and you're a better wife. I also have this mantra that you should always look like the girlfriend. <laughs> Now, some of you won't get that because you've given up on that a long time ago. I have, my intention is to look like the girlfriend. You all know history predicts if you look like the girlfriend, you get to leave the house. If you look like the mom, you're home making grilled cheese. That's your issue. So my intention is to keep it tight in the waist and cute in the face. I do whatever it takes to make that happen. I got all the right equipment. I got a Spanx. I got a girdle. I got a whole bunch of stuff that holds stuff together after having babies back to back for the last few years. And so another point of being very innovative was also celebrating what's made me this indie person, a person, a person who just likes to keep things very, very new and fresh. And so one of the things that's made me an indie mom and, 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 and now an OSI fellow is that I celebrate the two Baltimores that I grew up in. I grew up in two Baltimores. I grew up in West Baltimore. And when I say West Baltimore, you know, there's, there's a couple of kind of West Baltimores we can talk about. But for those of you all who are not clear, I, 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 I grew up on the side of Baltimore. You have Israel, and then you have Beirut. I grew up in Beirut. I don't have time to explain why that should be funny. Y'all need to go home and do some research. But the, at the end of the day, the Beirut I grew up in was a working class Beirut where everyone had a job. The moms and dads all lived in the house with you. I grew up right in West Baltimore. We were in an extended family. We lived with both my grandparents, my aunts, my uncles, my mom. 
And so the West Baltimore I grew up in in the 70s was a very family-friendly friendly working class Baltimore, right? These are people who went to work every day. Um, and then my mother had the bright idea to move me to the Northwest suburbs. She thought it would be like the Jefferson show moving on up. And so we, um, I don't have time to explain why that should be funny, but <laughs> y'all are not as smart as they make you all out to be. That's what you need to understand. I'm a little disappointed in all of you at this point. But she did this whole experiment of marrying my stepdad and he moved us out to the Northwest suburbs. And at the time, the Northwest suburbs was just a, a nice little area where all of um, my friends who were Jewish had moved to the Northwest suburbs because I found out that's the only place you could go. And so they moved you out there and it was all of you and then some, and some Gentiles and a couple of us. It was just two of us on my block. And when we showed up, it, 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 I don't know what happened. Everybody opened their window and they just started looking outside like, I think we got one, I think we got one. And, uh, <laughs> yep, yep, mom and dad, two of them. We got a family of four. We're going to ride this out, see what happens. We're going to ride this out. Because <laughs> everybody was banking. We weren't going to make it out there. And <laughs> this is before development. So we lived across from a patch of woods in a small area, and they called it the Lost World. And we were told never to go over there because there was a whole bunch of yeehaw and there were no horses. And so we knew, <laughs> real slow on this side, we knew. <laughs> Not to go where the yeehaw was going, okay? But the beautiful part about growing up in this dichotomous um, northwest suburb was that I had the awesome opportunity to meet people who didn't look like me and actually step into their worlds for a moment. And two of my best friends were twins who were Jewish, and they would go to Sunday school and Hebrew school, and they would teach me Yiddish words, and they would always teach me the words that were the dirty words, right? <laughs> because you have to know the dirty Yiddish words. You have to. And so they said, if ever somebody says this to you, then you should say that. And so I felt obligated to teach them something that they didn't know, double Dutch. <laughs> you know and I know that these two little Jewish girls did not know how to double dutch and neither did my white friend Beth. Beth didn't know how to double dutch either. And so my endeavor as a, as a part of reciprocity was to teach them something they didn't know. And I got a little bit over my head because I didn't factor in the whole lack of rhythm thing. It was real, <laughs> little tricky, little tricky, little tricky. But what it introduced me to was how beautiful it was to have a connection to your ancestry, your heritage, and your lineage. And how having that connection gave you something that oftentimes being a little girl of color from Baltimore never gave you. All I used to get about being a little girl, a, a girl of color from Baltimore was that your folks came from down south. Now down south is not a country. <laughs> It isn't, but it has its own culture, it has its mores, it has its norms, you know, it has its own cuisine, but it is certainly not a country. And, and that I felt like I was missing something the entire time because my Jewish friends used to go to Israel for the summer. They would go and they would visit their booby, right? And they would come back, Hava Nagila. I had none of that, I had none of that. All I had was like Rick James and like James Brown and I couldn't really, <laughs> And James Brown had me conflicted because he looked like a man, but his hair was shiny, and I just couldn't, I couldn't reconcile the two. And so I said, I need something deeper. I need something more. And I didn't even realize I needed something deeper and something more until I kept learning about my other friends. I had some good friends who were Italian. They let you know they were Italian. They let you know they would, their grandmother was from Sicily and she used to make pasta by hand. And I thought pasta came in a box. I didn't know that it was by hand that you made this stuff. And so they would teach me these things. It would give them license to do stuff. Having an ancestry and a heritage and a lineage connects you to something greater than yourself when the rest of the world suggests to you that you're just the ancestor of a slave. I needed something. I wanted something. I longed for something. I think that's why I used comedy. Even before I knew it, I was told I was funny as a kid. The laughter was my panacea for the pain. The pain of never really knowing where did my ancestors come from? And why are they the most hated but the most imitated people in the world? I said, somebody has got to help me out. And then came Roots, and I thought I was on to something. But Chicken George made me so mad. <laughs> I was like, why is his name Chicken and why is he George? Like, can we pick a lane and stay in it? I love Kunta Kente because he was like, look, I ain't giving Kunta, that's it. <laughs> but it still wasn't enough because even though Alex Haley did a phenomenal job educating me about our life before here in the States, I didn't have enough reinforcement in my school. I was told Nat Turner was a horrible man. 
If you do the research, this guy was a revolutionary. Whether you liked him or not, he believed in something and he went for it. He's no different than any other great martyr that we look to. He just happened to have the wrong color skin. And so I said to myself, how can I find out more about me? And the funny thing happened, I started having babies. <laughs> Some of y'all still don't see the connection. I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> That's a whole nother show, a whole nother day. But your children will give you license to want to be better, to want to know more. Your children will urge you to say, well, not only where did I come from, but where did I come from? Like, where did I come from? And so my kids, you know, who are very, you know, innovative people themselves, I have one who I was grossly afraid that she would end up somewhere nude because she loved being naked. I know everybody has that one child that just loves being naked. She was free in her nakedness. She would just stand there naked and go, <laughs> Mommy, this! <laughs> and being a quasi-intellectual, I needed to know, was that, genetically predis was that a genetically predisposed attitude? Did she come from a tribe of naked people who enjoyed being naked? <laughs> and saw no fault in the nakedness? Saw the beauty of the nakedness? Or was she going to end up on a pole at some point? That was my biggest fear. <laughs> And then we had this boy, we had this one daughter, the first daughter, she comes, she comes out at home. We had three natural births with a midwife, I could tell you that all day. And I know I had to be somewhere along the line, I kept believing there's some reason why birthing is fun to me. Somewhere in my ancestry, there's somebody who could have babies just, and I just squatted and had them, like straight up old school, I just squatted. <laughs> I know some of you all wanna be my friend now, I don't have time for that, listen. <laughs> Cause you think I'm super, you think I'm awesome. But, but I had these three babies, and the last one, the boy, nobody warned me. Nobody warned me how different these people are, not even my husband. <laughs> nobody warned me that the minute you take off his diaper, nobody warned me. I'm thinking I have birthed Hugh Hefner and Brown. Yes, I have. All of this caused me to want to know more about who and whose I am and where is the connection because you all know that you can, how many of you all in here know that you are Italian? Raise your hand if you're Italian. Raise your hand if you're, we got one Italian. Hey, what's up, baby? Me and you. Me and you all night. We're going to ride it out. Any Irish folks of Irish descent here? The Blarney Stone. We're going to kiss the Blarney Stone. I shouldn't even know that stuff is what I'm saying to you. How many folks are, are Scottish or English or Welsh or it, maybe it's the same thing? I don't know. I don't even care. <laughs> how many of our beautiful European folks, I mean, how many folks are of Jewish heritage? You're, you're a, a Jewish person or a Jewish American. You right here. I knew that. Shalom. I knew that. <laughs> I would like to say something like, holla at me later, but I don't really have time. <laughs> that was brilliant. I don't really, you know. Anyway, so... <laughs> Holla. No, okay, anyway. And so all of these things helped me to trust the process. Trust the process that I'm on this journey to really learn more about who and whose I am beyond the United States, beyond West Baltimore, beyond what I've been told. And so I had this audacious idea to create something based on my first introduction to the study of African American history. I went to a little historically black college called Bowie State University down in Maryland. Yes, thank you for clapping, white woman. You're awesome, because you... <laughs> the rest of these folks are like, what? <laughs> One of the oldest historically black colleges and universities in the country. And um, I went there, and I had this amazing professor, and he introduced me to the study of African-American history and African history. And I started learning about all these amazing things that my ancestors, yes, my ancestors, actually created. Like the first library. Yes, Timbuktu was not in Europe. <laughs> I know you're blown, aren't you? You're blown away by that. <laughs> I was told about how some of the most amazing things came out of the continent that's loathed and loved at the same time. And it urged me to want to know more, to want to be able to tell to my daughters, you know why? You walk with that little limp, your great, 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 great grandmother had that limp. And she was from Ghana, from a small village called Asankrangwa. But I can't tell her that just yet. 
And so my intention was to be deliberate and not just give it to me, but give it to other girls from my community and then give it to every girl that shares African heritage around the country. Is it a big idea? Of course it's a big idea, but I'll tell you why it's relevant. Because even though you say we're all in a melting pot, have you noticed that some of the, some of the things in the melting pot continue to rise to the top? <laughs> and some of the things in the melting pot stay at the bottom? And I'll be the first to tell you that I've been at the bottom and it sucks and I'm ready to float to the top. Right. And everybody that looks like me that shares my ancestry should be just as joyous, just as excited. Why will it make a difference? Because when you know who you are and where you come from, when the rest of the world punches you in the throat and says you're just the ancestor of a slave, you can always say that's not so. I can tell you exactly where my folks come from, what we were known for in our country, what was our biggest attribute, our moral sense, the way that we looked at things, the language we spoke, the way we prepared our food, how we were always this way. And I, I can give you more when you try to knock me down, I can stand back up. And I can use that stance to take advantage of what this country does offer me, which is education. And I can be educationally excellent. And then from my excellence, I can pursue every goal I've ever dreamt of. And from pursuing that goal, then I become a leader. And then when I become a leader, I give back to everybody that looks like me and that doesn't look like me until we're really a melting pot, a real melting pot. And so I decided that I would go right back to Park Heights where I came from. I would go right back to West Baltimore because now the biggest epidemic in West Baltimore is a chicken box. <laughs> now some of y'all don't know what that is. And you shouldn't. But it's literally a box of chicken. It's not that deep. <laughs> it's a little red and white checkered box of chicken and inside are pieces of a chicken and the chicken has been fried, dyed and laid to the side and it's been covered in hot sauce and, and I don't know what else, I don't know how old the grease is, I don't know if the chicken is dead or alive because sometimes it's still moving, I'm not real sure what a chicken box is but it has captured the lives of girls and boys that look like me and we eat that day in and day out. And I promise you, I wanna share them I want to share with them, listen, you're bigger than a chicken box. You have so much more to go for than a chicken box. How about we go and we, you, you, you try some fufu? How about I take you and you try some, some of the best dishes in the world? Can I, can I teach you about some hummus and some pita bread? Can I introduce you to some tabbouleh or some couscous? Can I take your palate somewhere where your mind won't take you just yet, but can I take your palate? So I created Goal Diggers, G-O-A-L-D-I-G-G-E-R-S, the Sankofa Project, Birthright Africa. And I said, I'm gonna introduce girls that look like me from my neighborhood. I'm gonna deliver them from the chicken box. That's one thing, <laughs> right? And then I'm gonna deliver their minds from complacency. I'm gonna deliver their hearts, hopefully, from thinking that all you're ever going to be is all you're ever going to be is all you're ever going to be. And I'm gonna introduce you to yourself using anthropology. I'm gonna pop you into communities and I want you to see, it's not just us that are crazy. I've met other crazy people that don't look like us. <laughs> One little boy I met that went to the country school with my daughter was very crazy. I wish I had time to tell you about him, but the boy had no cooth. I don't know where he came from. He thought everything was funny. His name was Finnegan. I changed his name and just in case y'all know Finnegan, I'm not talking about him. <laughs> Finnegan had no boundaries. He would just say stupid stuff. Be like, hey, Miss Johnson, my booty itches. This boy was four. <laughs> so anthropologically speaking, I wanted to pop you into his world and see what makes him tick. So we're going to use anthropology, technology. I'm not, a tech, I'm not a technologist. I didn't even know the word existed until I met Todd. And I'm relatively intelligent, but I don't care. But I'm going to introduce them to technology. I'm going to introduce them to searching their ancestry using the internet. And then DNA testing, forensic science. We're going to let you know exactly where you came from. And at the end of this all, you'll be more than just a girl from Baltimore. More than just a girl from Park Heights. You'll be more than just a girl. Maybe I wear this red hair because I'm genetically predisposed from my village. The women of red hair who slap people who are obnoxious. Maybe that's who I really am. <laughs> and this is Gold Diggers. The Sankofa Project, Birthright Africa, and I am Michelle, the indie mom of comedy. Thank you so much. Yeah.